So here we are again. After we played pawn to f5 and the pawn took us, we're going to play queen h4 check. And in this case, g3 is possible because we don't have the queen d5 move making a check and winning the rook because our king doesn't have any pawn on its own file. So queen e2 will force a swap of queens. And we're just swapping and reaching equality. We don't want that. So after pawn to g3 attacking the queen, we're going to play queen e7 check. And now white has to block it. And there's a few patterns to remember here. So let's look at what happens after a player plays g3. And now this bishop here will have two possible diagonals to go to. So of course this would be the ideal diagonal in such kind of openings with the fianchetto. But if they play bishop e2 to block, we're going to take the bishop in f5 and we have a threat. The threat is bishop e4 that wins immediately. So if white plays a move like queen to d2, bishop e4 wins the game. The rook is trapped and the, the knight going to f3 doesn't work because we can just take it for free. The bishop is pinned. So because of the threat of the bishop e4 move, what happens after knight f3 immediately with the idea of castling maybe, then that's the best chance for white. That, that's the, that's more correct move. After knight f3, we can castle alongside and after white castles, we are in a game where this bishop in e2 is not really doing his job of protecting the king from the fianchetto. When the king is playing, when the white player plays a move like g3, you've got to have the bishop in g2. In this case, he has it in e2. It doesn't mean we're completely winning here, of course. We have a long way to go if we want to prove ourselves being the stronger player. But let's look at what we have here. We have a majority of pawns from the opponent king side. Kings are castled by the other side, so that means that we can storm our pawns against the opponent king without worrying too much. Well, the, our opponent has a majority on the queen side, and uh, the central pawn is more advanced, so it's not complete. It's 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 still completely playable situation. Our best move is now is just a prophylactic move, king to b8, getting the the king into a square, into a dark square, considering that white only has a light square bishop and not a dark one, and now the game continues. So now our goal is to play c5. C5 puts more pressure on this on the d4 square and we threaten to take it. In this type of game, the pressure on the on the dark square in the center may be added by pawn to g6 and bishop to g7. It's important to remember this because that's the only good way to develop our dark square bishop, which is being a bit left out. However, it's wide to move. What happens after a move like c4? Let's look at this move just so we can look at the plan and the threats that we can make. This move here loses. It looks like a normal move. It looks like the white has every reason to start throwing these pawns on the queen side. The problem is that his, his king is more exposed. So just to make an example here, how do we exploit this pattern? We are putting pressure on the default square. We play queen check. And here we're talking about, once again, what happens when you play the fianchetto move without push without placing your bishop in the fianchetto position. After this check, and how does white stop it? Well, it wouldn't be recommendable to play the rook here, pinning your own rook. Afterwards, we're going to play g6. Remember that we have the two bishops, and they're both, they're both going to be active, and there's just going to be too much pressure. Look look at this. Look at how many squares are being controlled, and the uh, prevention of development of the a1 rook. So uh, a, qu of a swap of queens is not possible, because we could take, take, and then we have free material on the board. So if white doesn't block the rook, then another thing that can go wrong is simply king moving to a light square because then we can pin the knight with bishop e4. Oops, the pawn was not supposed to be in g6. But however, that's the plan. Bishop e4, and we're threatening to just take the knight and win material in d4. So once we get to infiltrate our rook in d4 and develop our bishop to c5 and get the other rook, this rook here in a1 will be a weakness for a long time because how is it gonna how is how is it gonna be developed? And well, a move like d5 doesn't work in this case because we're pinning a piece, so we're gonna play g5 and potentially well, depending on white on what white does. But we had the plan of pushing these pawns on the king side already, and we are gonna do it. In this case, it's coming with a threat of winning the knight. And even if white were to play its best, we are still gonna he's gonna find himself facing moves like h5 as well. And uh, yeah, adv advantage is massive. I'm going to leave it there. We've mentioned the problems of, of blocking the check with bishop e2. So let's go back from the beginning. All right, this is our chance to recap this specific line. Knight c3, knight f6, bishop g5. We protect it with the knight. And after the e4 idea, which is a theory, we take, 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 and f3. We don't take because we don't give up development. We don't give the present of development to our opponent. We play knight f6. And bishop takes, we take with the e-pawn. We are now not worrying at all. We have an idea of playing f5, as mentioned a few times already. 
So after pawn takes and pawn up, let's remember that e5 leads to an absolute disaster and the pawn has to take, which leads us to play queen h4 anyway. Now the best move is g3. And with this check is useless, queen e7. Now I'm going to be mentioning the other two ideas to block the queen and the knight. Let's look at the weird one, just for fun. Knight blocking like this. Right, this seems to be making some sense in a way that, as we mentioned, once you do the fianchetto structure, you've got to put the bishop in g2, right? So here, first of all, let's take the pawn back. We're equally material, except we have the bishop pair. But white can think, okay, I'm going to play bishop g2, and then castle, and uh, it doesn't look like this situation is bad at all. The bishop is targeting a very strong diagonal. So what's our best move? We have to long castle. And now what happens after white castles? Then we play the familiar queen e3 check. Now this should be blocked with the rook to f2. What happens after the king moves? Now we can play bishop g4 and we are pinning this knight and we are threatening to take it. Needless to say, rook e1 loses immediately because we have two pieces attacking. White has two pieces defending, but then we're going to put three pieces. The bishop cannot protect the knight from f3 because he gets taken, by the way, with the checkmate. And after bishop to f1, we still have check bishop f3 attacking the king. King can't go anywhere, so I will have to block. And we are winning this free piece. So back a few moves. After the check of the queen in e3, as we mentioned, white should block it with f2. Another thing I needed to mention is after king moves, and we say that bishop g4 wins the game. Uh, needless to say, bishop f3 is not possible because we can just take it. So rook going to f2 is the way to stop this. So the best move now by black is h5. The goal is to play h4, take the pawn in h3, and then develop the last bishop and attack the weak the weakness of the minority of pawns of the white player. So we're going to be targeting this pawn, the, the, the rook is pinned. So after h5, what can white do? The queen can't move to d2 or d3, gets taken everywhere. What happens after queen to c1? Best move by white. Then we have to swap. Right, because otherwise white white will seize the initiative. If we move the queen away, we will we will no longer be pinning the rook. The rook will come with an attack on the bishop. This is uh, not looking very good. Even though I'm still glad we have the bishop pair, but I, I, I don't want to give white so many attacking chances. Queen takes, rook takes, and now we play g6. We have to protect this bishop. We have the h5 pawn protecting g4, which is crucial, and we can play. We can activate the other bishop as well. Black is now a simple idea. Bishop h6 as well, it's possible. Attacking the rook, uh, the, rook the bishop could be taking the pawn in c2, so the, the, the mini squares that are attackable by two bishops will, is visible more than ever in an open game like this. So after the best move, which is c3, now there's no point in going to h6. The move now is h4. Why? Well, the whole point of going through all of these openings is that we understand how we're going to be facing them in the end game. We're going to find all the weaknesses and then win go to a winning end game. Uh, this, this video and, and, and all the other videos that I'm making are never going to be about like these kind of things like winning 10 moves and this nonsense because you can only win in 10 moves if, if your opponent is rubbish. So what, what, what we're going for here is we have a majority of pawns. We're going to be playing accurately and exploit that against the minority of pawns. So we play h4. It makes perfect sense. Because one of these pawns will be a passed pawn. So the sooner we advance, the better. Because if white gets to advance uh, their pawns before us, then we might be in trouble. The best move by white, according to the engine, is rook to f1. Because the, this lift of rook will be will be useful to take the bishop. And then um, the pawn takes back and the rook takes back. And basically white will be giving a rook for the bishop and a pawn. Which is necessary in order to calm the attack here. After rook c to f1, we cannot allow this to happen because then we wouldn't be really fine we'd be losing the bishop pair and uh we'd be going to an end game where we'd, we'd be equal um the advantage is still like minus one so but but that's clearly not not enough we gotta we gotta continue this end game leading to win so now the move is h3 white can't take the bishop because otherwise we take the bishop with the threat of taking the rook so the bishop will have to move to h1 what happens after bishop to f3 the attack is nullified Needless to say, well, all of these squares were taken, so if it's either f3 or h1. In both cases, our next move is going to be c5. Clearly, we know the reason. If pawn takes, we could take back uh, pinning the rook. That's uh, terrible. Also, we are threatening bishop h6 and the idea of bishop e3. If white pushes the pawn to d5, for example, creating a passed pawn protected by the bishop, idea maybe of playing c4, black continues with this plan. Rook to e8, and after c4, Black continues with bishop to h6. 
this is a threat now and the rook doesn't have the g2 square to go to, a move like knight to f4 preventing us from reaching e3, also allowing the rook maybe some escape somewhere else, is not met by bishop takes. I know that this will isolate a pawn of our opponent, will close up this, the file of the rook. That will also allow potentially the infiltration of our rook in an open file of the king. Yes, that looks kind of good and uh, I'm sure lots of players will be happy to do this, but no, we're not going to do it because we keep control over the board. Bishop g7, there's no reason to panic and just play the best move. Bishop g7 going for d4 and white can't just go back with the knight because then an, a pawn is falling. So let's look at this uh, potential idea of swapping stuff here doesn't work. We can play bishop to d4, check, the king will have to move, then we can swap rooks and then the, the pawn in b2 will be available. We still have the bishop pair and it's a winning end game. And we have this fortress of bishop and pawns protecting each other. And the rook that can come in any time grants black a lot of control over the light squares. So these were just uh, some of the main ideas. Of course, uh, there could be lots of small differences in the openings, in the lines that will happen in the in the games you'll be playing whenever you face the Verasov. But um, the more lines we learn, the more we will be able to face similar situations because all situations will have very similar patterns, right? Because it's the same setup. It's the Verasov. Let's look at the last scenario now. So after e4, let's recap. We take take. Take and then f3, knight f6, bishop takes, we take back, take, and now f5. Best move is to take, queen h4 check. Best move is g3 because, because of all the disasters we went through before. Queen e7 check, and now we're going to be blocking it with the queen. All right, so we're not interested in taking so that our opponent can take back and develop pieces. We're going to be taking the pawn. We're equally material, but we have the same pattern. We have three pawns here against two, and here we're going to be castling long side. But white has more pawns on the queen side, but he doesn't have the bishop pair. Now, the white player should take the queen, because right now we're threatening something. We're threatening bishop takes e2. So if white maybe develops the knight, for example, then we just take the pawn. There's no... There's no compensation. We can just take the pawn. And uh, after queen takes and bishop takes, white does not have this rook c1 move, skewering the bishop and potentially winning the pawn and infiltrating in the 7th rank, allowing a better development because of bishop e4 coming with the threat on the knight. And then we have all sorts of threats happening. Bishop e4 is possible, c6 even, or even just castle alongside and then king b8. It's not a problem. We're, what I'm saying is we, we're going to be up a pawn. White has an isolated pawn. And it's an open game. We have the two bishops, and we're not. White is not re-winning the pawn back. So knight f3 is not good. So let's look at what happens after bishop to g2. Then this is a this is a, a scenario we've seen before. Not 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 exactly the same, but we've seen it before. This bishop is really strong. We've got a castle alongside. We have no reason not to castle. This move also allows the release of the queen. Queen b4 is a massive threat right now, and uh, so. Well, it's white to move, so white will have, will be forced, kind of forced to swap queens. So because of this threat, white white will have to move, right? So let's remember we're putting pressure on the c2 squares because we're ahead in development. We could go for a pawn because our our king is castle, so we can go for a pawn. We're not going to have to worry too much. And uh, also the rook is putting pressure on d4. A move like, okay, let's say the best move by white is to take the queen. And then we take back with the bishop, our development is complete, we're putting pressure here and here. Knight f3 doesn't work because we win a pawn in c2. c3 doesn't work because we play rook h to e8, and white is super passive, right? Uh, what is he going to do? He's going to have to move the king, he can't castle. I mean castling, I mean castling, long side gives a checkmate in two, bishop check, and then king, uh, rook moves, and then rook down. Whereas knight going to e2, and... Uh, this very passive move gives us the possibility to play bishop g5 and uh, you know we're pinning the knight and the potential uh, increase of the pressure on the on the knight i mean this is an incredibly pleasant position to play and the advantage is consider something like up, like black is up a piece yeah so black will have to continue here from and figure out how to capitalize on this game going back a few moves Right after white plays bishop g2 and black castle long side, earlier we went through swap of queens, which gives uh, black more activity. Also, we mentioned the threat of queen to b4. What happens after white castles long side, which is a little bit uh, more accurate move, slightly stronger, but now we swap queens, and after knight takes back, we're going to play h5. So we're going to have to launch an attack on the opponent, h file, and g file, and f file, before he gets the chance to do the same on our king. 
So in this case, the disadvantage of the white player is slightly reduced. Somehow white managed to develop, he's got a nice bishop, and the knight could be jumping to plenty of different squares, and the rooks are able to join the game. So this is an endgame that is worth looking at. Let's just look at the main ideas before ending the first chapter of the Verosov. Now here, we're going to be playing our bishop into this diagonal. We're going to be playing... Okay, we played h5. h5. Clearly we, we want to go and uh, clearly we're going to go forward, but the best move by white now, engine move, is h4. And now black continues with g6. So what ideas could I mention here? I was thinking first of all to start by going through bishop h3 because that forces a swap of bishops and white, and white can find some relief into depriving the opponent of the bishop pair. But this is, uh, this is wrong because of a matter of tempos. Our development is more fluid than our opponent. And let's look at the, the silly position of the rook. For example, bishop takes, then the rook will be in a silly position. It will be one tempo away from being able to be developed. This rook will love to be in h1. From there, it has access to the central files and can look down. But from here, the rook will have to do one and two moves before it can become useful. So now we're going to play bishop h6 with a check. The king moves. And now rook to e8, finishing our development. So that kind of move, I think, looking at bishop h3, which was a bad move, was actually instructive in a way that it teaches the, the importance of looking at swaps and how they can be helpful. For example, yes, I'm happy to give away the bishop pair because that makes your rook one tempo away from becoming active. And that tempo is crucial for me to start to, to, to make a check and then exploit that tempo for myself, going to e8, and now I come with an attack on the knight, and now the game is won. This knight is stuck there, it can't move. Well, it will have to be defended by the rook, because let's look at what happens after the knight goes to f4, then we can simply take the knight, pawn takes back, white will have two isolated pawns, but then we also have an attack on d4, white has a weak back rank, the, 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 pawn, the rook cannot be taken back because of the checkmate threat. And so we can, we can just take the knight. And what happens after the rook defends the knight? Then we exploit the backward pawn, we start looking at the weaknesses of our opponent, always look at the pawns that are backwards and cannot be defended by the pawn, we're going to play rook to e3. Yes, it's true that we, this is also another instructive thing, it's true that we can't take the pawn if white knight were to stay there, but it's also true that that forces the knight to stay there. And it's really the worst use you can make of your pieces if you force them to protect pawns like a, a pawn maybe could be protecting a piece in a in a nice outpost but the idea of using a piece to to keep protecting a backward pawn is very sad and also the, what's the goal here the goal is to play rook to e8 and attack the knight further what happens if white plays rook to d3 suggesting a swap just to release the pressure then we can just take pawn takes and then bishop e3 and we are going on the weak pawn and we're going to easy winning endgame. Also, just one move ago after rook e3, needless to mention that if white offers more protection to the knight, let's remember that there's a weak back rank, and uh, well, this is just a blunder, which take the pawn in d4, the, rook, the knight can't take back. Right, the last thing I'm going to be mentioning for this video is, like earlier, earlier we went through bishop h3, and we talked about the losing tempos and the exploiting the weaknesses. What happens after a more normal move, like knight to c3, for example? Uh, how do we understand our advantage here? Our advantage comes from the from the two bishops. So if our bishops, if our bishop pair is not challenged in this game, we're just gonna keep it. So yeah, as I said, knight c3 looks like a normal move actually, but it's really bad because bishop g4 wins the game. The the rook will have to move away, and we will be able to take the pawn in d4. The rook can't go to a dark square here to to save itself from the bishop because of the bishop pinning the rook. And after taking the point d4, let's not panic about rook e8 check. After rook check, king to d7, and the knight doesn't have any checks, the bishop doesn't have any good checks, and the idea now is simply to carry on with the material advantage. White will not be able to double up the rooks because we have a check, and this check will allow us to win the rook in, uh, in e8 completely for free. So white will have to remove the rook. And so after rook goes back, we carry on with a clean extra pawn. I'm going to leave it at that for the video, but there's going to be more videos coming.